Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, An Emerald in the Rough, Why Hydraulic Screen Filtration is the Hidden Gem of Golf Course Industry Irrigation, presented by Evoca Water Technologies. My name is Lisa Wick. I'm a Senior Manager of E-Learning Programs here at GCSAA. Before I turn things over to Sonia Muniz, who is the Sales Manager at Evoca Water Technologies, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We are recording today's event. You'll receive access to that recording via follow-up email. We do have several handouts that you can download from your GoToWebinar control panel. If your control panel has minimized, you'll see a little narrow strip with an orange rectangle at the top. Click on that. That will maximize the control panel. You'll be able to access those handouts. You'll also see there the question answer box. Your audio is muted in this system, but we welcome you to type in questions as we go along today. And you'll do that in that question answer box. At the end, we will have a question and answer session. And if you want to be unmuted to ask your question directly on that same tab, you'll see a little raise hand button. You could click on that and that will let us know that you would like to be unmuted. Evoca Water Technologies is a leading provider of water and wastewater treatment solutions, offering a broad portfolio of products, services, and expertise to support industrial, municipal, and recreational customers. We will learn more about that today from the team. Please join me in welcoming all of our presenters. And I'll turn it over to Sonia. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our presentation. My name is Sonia Muniz. I am the sales manager here at Evoqua for the VAF product line, now Silem. Today, I am joined by a fantastic group of individuals and colleagues that together will be bringing this informative presentation to you. First, we have Jerry Griffith, our mid-USA sales executive, Mr. Jordan Bynan, our Eastern USA sales executive, and Madison Hammerberg, our global product manager for the BAF product line. Like Lisa mentioned, we want to encourage you to ask any questions you might have via the chat, the question box on the press on the software. We will be answering those questions towards the end of our presentation. Now, without further ado, here's Madison. Thank you, Sonia, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you, Lisa, as well. Uh, before we get started into the rest of our content about hydraulic uh, filters, I'm going to talk for a second about Evoqua Water Technologies. At Evoqua, we are all about transforming water and enriching life. Um, by the numbers, we are in nine countries with more than 150 locations. We have over 200,000 installations and work with 38,000 customers. Recently, you may have heard that uh, we are getting to join Xylem, uh, which brings even more depth to um, our water portfolio and uh, our knowledge within the water spaces. So without further ado, as our friends at Xylem do like to say, let's solve water. I'm gonna start today by talking a little bit about water sources that are available, um, as well as global impacts of water and some of the challenges that we are facing right now in availability of water. So the water sources that are available um, are fresh and potable water, recycled or reused water, and gray water. So fresh potable water is the water that we think of that comes from our taps, um, our showers, sinks, and things like that. These are purchased through our local, local municipalities. So some of the pros to fresh and potable water is that it is easy to source, it's readily available. Um, however, sometimes it can be cost prohibitive, especially when you're talking about large quantities of water needing to be used, um, things like golf course irrigation applications. So that brings us into recycled and reuse water. So this is water that comes from a naturally occurring source or potentially man-made runoff. Um, it definitely has some pros as it's lower cost than fresh water, um, and it does not have extensive storage requirements. So you're not needing to put it in a tank and store it on site because it is readily available. Um, however, it is going to be required to be sourced by the facilities team, whether this is a lake or a river that you're finding local to you, it will need to be sourced. Gray water, on the other hand, is actually reclaimed from the facility itself. Um, so if you think about taking the water that runs off from um, potentially washing your hands or something like that, then you store that. It's treated and filtered, um, and then it's reused from there. Um, so some of the pros to this is it's free since it's already been purchased the first time as fresh potable water. Um, however, large storage and collection is necessary. 
um, and it's also needed to be treated uh, very specifically to make sure that none of the contaminants um, are potentially hazardous between reuse. So now that we've talked about some of the water sources that avail are available, let's talk about why these water sources are important. So right now, 10% of the global population lives in countries with high or critical water stress. Within the US, over 15% of the continental US is in extreme drought by May of this year. These trends have continued and are growing throughout the year. Globally, 26% of the population does lack safe drinking water. So when we talk about fresh potable water and using these for certain applications, we really see trends globally of wanting to switch more towards recycled and reuse water to help ease these concerns with availability and clean drinking water. And we know within the golf course irrigation industry, um, this is a big push and something that has already been um, started to be implemented and is making a big impact in helping. So how can the golf course irrigation industry help with the water crisis? Right now, about a half a percent of the total water use in the U.S. per day is used for golf course irrigation. Depending on the climate, golf courses can use up to a million gallons per day to keep their greens healthy. And it's estimated the golf course spend up to $107,000 per year on water sourcing and brush bottle water. So not only is this having a global impact with the water crisis, but it's also really expensive for golf courses themselves. It's estimated that because of these reasons, 13% of golf courses have already adopted recycled or reuse water. So hopefully this continues to give some insight into why switching to reuse and recycled water um, are important. And as we continue, we'll talk about how best to go ahead and start doing that. Before we go too much further though, we do have a question here. And that question is, how does your golf course currently source water for irrigation? And we have a few different options. So maybe your golf course um, plans to continue to use fresh and potable water. Maybe you're currently researching recycled or reused water options, but you're not quite ready to sort switch yet. Maybe you're planning your transition to recycled water and it's something you've thought about for a while. Maybe you're actively switching, you've purchased equipment and you're waiting for it to be installed. Or finally, maybe you already utilize recycled water. So go ahead and take a second and please ring in your answers and we'll talk about this question once everyone's had a chance to respond. Thanks, Madison. These votes are coming in now. Thank you so much, Lisa. I know it seems like a long time when it's silent like that. <laughs> We appreciate everyone being engaged in the session and giving us answers. It definitely helps make everything go a little bit smoother on our end. All right, here we go. Great, thank you, Lisa. So we can see that um, we're kind of split right now uh, between uh, golf courses that are already using recycled water and um, golf courses that are using fresh potable water. Um, so that's definitely um, interesting as we talk through this. Uh, hopefully we can provide some good insight to, to everyone here that um, are on both sides. So let's continue and talk a little bit about the advantages of filtration now that we've identified water sources um, and we know that we want to maybe in, minimize some of those environmental impacts and, and uh, maximize our lawn care. We can do so through filtration. So why is filtration important? And that's because of the common water contaminants um, that are within our sourcing. And these can be both from fresh potable water or from reuse recycled water. And we can have contaminants anywhere from less than a micron, and these are our chemical compounds, and up to large debris, things like mulch, sticks, pebbles, bugs, and trash. Really with filtration, we're gonna be talking about kind of this small debris area, and that's between those 10 to 1,000 micron ranges. Um, commonly known as microplastic sand, silt, and clay. These contaminants are important because of their effect on lawn care. So common water contaminants can create alkaline soil conditions. 
And so when we talk about alkaline soil conditions, these are things that are leaning away from the neutral side of things. So water on its, uh, on its own should be a pH of seven. As it starts to trend more towards ammonia, baking soda, that is when we say it's in alkaline conditions. <clears throat> from research, we know that gray water is shown to create a substantial increase in soil pH. We also know that long grasses should be kept within soil conditions of six to seven for ideal growth conditions. And anything above 7.5 should be considered high for soil conditions. And so we can start to see as these contaminants in the water create these alkaline conditions, it can then affect the soil, which can affect lawn care. And the effects of these alkaline soil conditions on grass are yellowing and discoloration, stunted growth, weed and moss growth. Filtration advantages go past just lawn care as well. It can have a big impact on our pipes and equipment, which can actually cause breakages if they're not properly filtered. And that's because things like rust, contaminants can all build up and create issues within the piping instant structure, especially when we talk about some of the smaller components of our irrigation systems, like our sprinkler heads. This is particularly true in areas of the US that have hard water conditions, which are commonly known to cause corrosion. Corrosion can cause severe damage in irrigation systems, including leaks, cracks, and structural breakdowns. And we have highlighted here some of the areas within the US that are specifically prone to hard water conditions. The Midwest, Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Arizona, and South Carolina. That's not to say across uh, the continental US, other issues cannot cause the same pipes uh, equipment damage that hard water does. So let's go ahead and transition into another question. And that is, has your current irrigation system ever resulted in any of the issues that we've mentioned, such as broken pipe and equipment due to clogs or buildup, difficulties maintaining lawn health or green color due to the water quality, frequent downtime for maintenance, maybe all of the above or none of the above. And so we'll go ahead and give a little bit more time and allow everyone to answer this question as well. Thank you again for your participation in these poll questions. I couldn't help but notice that Kansas is one of the hard water places. Which I know is true, but I did not know that as a child. I only learned it when I moved away from Kansas for the first time, Madison. I was thinking of the same thing about the Midwest. I've been in the Midwest most of my life. And so I was doing the research and like, you know, hard water is really actually not that common outside of some of these areas. So it's interesting when you're immersed in it, how you, you don't notice the differences, right? Exactly right. All right, let's see where we stand with this poll. Okay, so again, kind of a slip breakdown here, but we do have quite a few of our audience that has dealt with um, either breakages or um, all of the above with some of these issues. Um, and so we can talk a little bit more as we go forward about how filtration can really help mitigate some of these issues. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to my colleague to talk about selecting the right uh, filters. And Jerry, I think you're up next. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Madison, and uh, again, thank you, Lisa, for putting this together for us. So as, as I mentioned, my name is Jerry Griffith. I'm the Regional Sales Representative for the Evoqua Advanced Filtration and Separation Division. And today I'm here to give you an overview of part of particulates found in water sources and how we can remove them with a various array of different automatic screen filters. So as you can see on this page, particulates come in many different shapes and sizes. Understanding what's really in your water is important when selecting the right filter and the degree of filtration. One method of understanding what's in your water is to have a particle size distribution uh, analysis ran on it. And you can do that through your local lab or even by coordinating with one of our Evoqua sales representatives that can provide uh, instructions on where to submit and how to submit to our lab where we can take a deep dive into the analysis and come up with the best solution for your specific operations. Um, as you can see here, the centrifugal separators are really good when facing challenges of denser particles such as sand, and, and, and higher degrees of hair and other things that may be in the water. But in most cases, what you'll find is the particles creating the most challenges in your irrigation systems 
are much finer in degree than that and mi micron particles. So that's where the, the screen filtration comes in, which can be removed in particulates and down to the 10 to 1,000 micron range, as Mass mentioned previously. Any finer than that really requires a bag or a cartridge filter, which is a manual process of utilizing either a cartridge housing or change out the filters, or you can go to an automated solution as, such as a micro sand filter. Both of those can get you down to that high, half micron levels, but these are not normally needed in an irrigation process. We typically find these systems in, in golf courses utilizing somewhere between the, the one to 300 micron screen elements. So now that we know a little bit about um, particles in the water. Let's flip on over to the next slide where we'll go over different types of automatic screen filters. We can see here that there are three main types of automatic screen filters. Electrically driven, which utilizes an electric motor to drive the cleaning mechanism. A piston driven, which uses the piston to drive the cleaning mechanism. And then lastly, the hydraulic filter that uses system water from the process stream to drive that rotation. We'll break down all of these in more detail over the next couple of slides. Uh, regarding, regarding the requirements and functionality, you can see based on this table a side-by-side -side comparison of each filter and what's needed. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide where we'll talk about electric driven filters and how it works specifically in more detail. The electrically driven motor is an effective method of cleaning, but it's a bit more expensive to operate and maintain. Water is filtered through a series of screens and as the screens ac accumulate with dirt, a differential pressure is experienced across the elements. That then triggers a flush cycle where a motor begins to spin and rotate the internal cleaning nozzles. Limit switches are then needed to ensure the internal shaft drives back and forth across the full length of the screens. This is imperative to ensure a complete removal of debris that is accomplished. Some of the drawbacks, as you can imagine, to this style of filter are parts to maintain can become expensive because there are quite, uh, quite a bit more of them. Training to operate and maintain can be more complex uh, due to the limit switches and programming and, and uh, electric motors. You'll need additional site power requirements because you are required to use electric motors, right, uh, to drive this. And then downtime for maintenance can also lead to a reduced manpower and costly irrigation issues. So now let's talk about a little bit of the piston filter. The similar to the electric driven filter regarding the screen elements, that same differential pressure comes across uh, the two dirty screens as they start to foul out. The limit switches, um, this filter uses a piston though to drive the cleaning nozzles. During that flush cycle, directional limitations of the piston can cause some particles to be left behind, leading to a less effective cleaning process. This can be a more cost-effective solution. Uh, although it can be a more cost-effective solution, there are all, also some similar drawbacks to it. Uh, still quite a bit of parts and expensive to maintain. Uh, same thing with maintenance uh, needed and maybe a lack of effective cleaning will not will decrease the amount of performance that you're expecting out of your filter. Additional water waste is also required due to some of the longer flush cycles. So now that you've seen kind of how the electric motor and the piston driven filter operator, I wanna take a look at this hydraulic style of filter that uh, Emerald in the rough and how it operates much more efficiently. Uh, here's a, a picture of a hydraulic screen filter. Hydraulic filters use the natural flow of the process stream, which reduces the complexity of the filtering mode itself. It uses much more minimal components and provides a maximum cleaning power. So let me walk you through the breakdown of these components and, and how it operates. So at this point, I want to kind of explain to you the process of how these filters work internally. The previous two slides don't really give as good as an illustration, so let me walk you through this one and point out some of the key differences. So as you can see in this filter, the water coming on the inlet side then travels through a coarse screen where some of the larger debris, if you're pulling off of um, pond water or it may have some leaves and shells or whatever may be you know, organic in nature and larger in nature, will get caught on the outside of that coarse screen the then water travels through the core screen and down the vessel toward the outlet. As you can see, there's a fine screen. That fine screen is the one that's interchangeable anywhere from 10 to 1,000 micron. And as it goes through that screen, the filtered water now comes out and exits through the water outlet. So that's a good illustration of how the differential uh, uh, pressure will start to accumulate as or increase as the dirt accumulates across that screen. So usually what we program these at is a seven pounds difference across the two screens. That would then trigger the flush valve. 
as you can see there, there'll be an automated flush valve tied to a standard controller, 120 controller, that would signal the flush valve to open. That triggers the cleaning uh, nature of the filter. So contrary to the electric motors and hydraulic driven motors, we have, uh, or pistons, we have the hydraulic water flow through the process stream that is then now creating the suction in the filter. So as the flush valve opens to atmosphere, the differential pressure, the what then starts to happen triggers the water motor. The water motor by design with the 90 degree elbows start to begin to rotate in opposite directions. That drives the mechanism. That's really where the, the, the cream is in the, the pudding is where that water motor starts to rotate. It's now rotating that shaft across a bi-directional screw. And that's allowing the, the suction screen nozzles to go traverse along the length of the screen. That gives you that full 100% clean in typically 10 to 15 seconds during a flush cycle. Uh, the dirt is now sucked off the inside of the screens and travels through that hollow shaft and out the water motor nozzles and then into drain. So as it's cleaning, the filter continues in continuous operation mode until the differential pressure uh, returns back to the pre-designed, uh, pre-desired set point, which is typically around the zero to one PSID. Uh, so again, as I mentioned, the filtering stays filtering 100% uh, continuous through the operation, lasts about 10 to 15 seconds, and then you have a, you know, 24/7 operation on a very low maintenance filter. So hopefully that explained. Uh, we also have some good videos if you search, you know, online for operations that would also uh, give you a, a quick illustration of how these things work. So hopefully that provided a good explanation of how the filter works. Next, I want to pause and ask a quick question. Which type of filtration do you use, if any? I have a quick question for you while those uh, answers are coming in. Sure. That picture that you just showed us of the hydraulic filter, how big is that filter? That's a great question, Lisa, and thank you for asking that. So we have a various array of different sizes and models, all the way down from a what we call a V200. Uh, we have it in a plastic and a stainless. And that filter is different in design from the one you saw slightly. It uses the same operational and mechanical uh, uh, principles. Um, and, and those can range anywhere from the three to five foot range, um, just depends on the uh, piping arrangement that's coming with it. And then the ones that you saw in the model go anywhere from a 250 uh, all the way up to multiple skidded options, which we have some pictures down later in the slideshow. And those can run, you know, in various ranges of sizes, but you're typically looking at as a footprint around the five foot is what you're needing, but also you have to take into consideration the uh, the bulkhead on the end, which requires you to pull the screen out. Uh, so, you know, um, anywhere from the five to, you know, larger five to 10 uh, feet in diameter or, or length, I should say, that you're required for this. And okay, as far as the, good. yeah, and you know, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. yeah, and it all really depends on flow, uh, how much process flow you're running is and degree of filtration that will help us decide kind of what size filter is best for you. And then, you know, that will determine the, the footprint that will take. Very good. So thank you for putting together that poll. I see that we got a good 50% that's uh, not using filtration. Um, and 30% that's already used in hydraulic, which is excellent. And then 20 is, is unsure. So I would you know, encourage you all, if you're, if you're not sure if you're using filtration or you're not using filtration at all, and if any of this, um, you know, any of those challenges that you're experiencing, your, your water systems are, are something that you're experiencing, you know, I encourage you to go ahead and reach out um, to the contacts info that was provided pre at the beginning of this slide. And we'll be happy to help work through um, some of the operational requirements that you have on your site and see if there's something we can help you with. Uh, um, thank you for that. So um, moving into the next slide of the hydraulic filter systems. Hydraulic filters, as we mentioned before, use the natural flow of the process stream. It reduces the complexity of the filtering, uses minimal components and provides that maximum cleaning power. Uh, so the, as you can see here, what we previously discussed, there's far less parts associated with hydraulic filter, which comes with many advantages. It averaging around 70% less parts 
which reduce cost, complexity, and repairs. So as those that don't use filtration or are not sure if you use filtration, it didn't look like anyone was using uh, either the electric driven or piston filters. Um, if as, as you look around to possibly looking at filter solutions, just keep in mind that the additional parts that'll come with the, the drive and pistons, hopefully that this part of the presentation has been able to educate you in a, in a way that as you're looking around, you can kind of compare and contrast the different advantages. I mean, as you can see, there's far less parts in, in moving pieces with the hydraulic driven style. So we do have these in compact uh, designs. So as to answer your question, uh, Lisa, here's an illustration around how we have an example uh, configuration for 1500 GPM filters. We have two in series that allow you to kind of divert the flow across the two and then a side-by-side -side comparison uh, between the size of a piston filter and the size of a hydraulic filter uh, there side by side. So really when it comes to sizing, footprint's always something you want to consider. Um, the, the, like I said, the image on the right kind of shows you how we put them in parallel. I've seen uh, arrangements where they're stacked one over the other. Um, so it really, we have a vast array of manifolding that can be done to accommodate any situation. Uh, from the lowest flow of 30 GPM to basically an unlimited unlimited flow. Um, there's really no limit uh, that we can do with this design. So to the next slide, here's another kind of cutaway illustration of a live uh, image that shows um, the, the filter, the inside. You can see the suction nozzles. It's just a, a cutaway example, right? So we have the, the inlet interior screen. You've got the suction nozzles that rotate along it and you get a full cleaning uh, across a uh, single pass. So the flush cycles, again, I think, you know, the industry leading uh, less than 1% of the flow, it takes about 10 to 15 seconds and it never stops uh, cleaning throughout, you know, the backwash cycle. So it's really good advantages to that. So the next slide is another quick poll question. What, now that you know a little bit about the different filters, what advantages do you find specifically uh, on the hydraulic filters most appealing? Go ahead and select all that apply. Thank you again for all your participation during the poll. It really helps us understand the industry and also see where there's opportunity to help you all out. All right, let's digest this. Looks like we got a really good mixed bag. So we have some spacing requirements, reduced water. Of course, we know in today's environment, water scarcity is a, an issue. And so some of the other filters or no filters, uh, you know, would require a lot less uh, flushing. We've got the winner here, I think, is the continuous flushing capabilities. Yeah, I agree. Um, we can't afford downtime. And so when you have a filter, if no filter, you know, and you got downtime and you're replacing the, the maintenance, it takes a lot of manpower in the irrigation to keep these things fixed and, you know, keep them from clogging. Uh, so I can see that as, uh, you know, a number one leading indicator of some of the challenges we have out there. And, and that's where I think filtration can really help uh, to reduce the amount of downtime and maintenance associated with keeping your, your golf courses and, and landscapes nice and green and lush for, for your customers. So thank you for participating in the poll. At this point, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer over to my colleague, Jordan Biden, who's gonna to talk to you about from theory to practice. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks everybody again for, for joining the call here uh, to talk about some irrigation. So as Jerry mentioned, uh, I'll be discussing um, a little bit of some theory to practice. And I want to uh, review a case study we did for a golf course out in San Diego. So obviously water is very critical uh, in, the, in the valley over there. So definitely a, a great opportunity for us um, to go in there and, and try to help this customer out because they were experiencing some difficulties uh, with their current filtration system and it was causing issues with high flush volumes um, and it was leading to uh, large amounts of waste in which you know a, a place like San Diego, of course, uh, water is very critical 
uh, and it definitely uh, hurt their uh, sustainability targets. Um, it's a complex system, and, you know, took a while for maintenance, uh, finding parts, et cetera, uh, which, you know, took a long time to fix uh, and routinely led to uh, interruption in their irrigation schedule. And that's a big, big bad, right? So we want to make sure we're putting something out there that's not going to be a headache uh, for anybody out there and making sure that uh, it's easy to work on and something that will not uh, cause issues with the irrigation schedule. And then, you know, finally, they were having issues with damage of their nozzle heads uh, with their filtration equipment as well. And that led to higher costs for repair uh, and taking even more time down to uh, replace these things to get their uh, pump station back up online. So what we ended up doing was putting obviously one of our systems in there. And uh, you know this, this led to really great results. We were able to, to save them quite a bit of money and, and their total, total overall operation costs. Um, and then also on, on cleaning costs as well. So our, our filters are very easy to work on. Um, they take 30 to 60 minutes, um, or yeah, 30 to 60 minutes to do a complete rebuild of one. Um, and that's the case with a lot of the hydraulic filters out there. Um, and ours is you know, very low flushing. So we have about 1%, uh, like Jerry mentioned earlier, of the, the flush water um, from the total flow coming out. So it definitely helps with sustainability. But you know the, the last poll question was great, you know, having that continuous flow. But one of the, my opinion, the best benefits of these hydraulic filters is the ease of operation. Uh, being able to break these things apart, completely rebuild them, and be able to get them back up online. If there are any preventative maintenance uh, tasks that need to be done, <clears throat> is great importance to make sure we're not interrupting schedules, especially during the peak summer weather. Uh, you know, nothing's worse. Whenever everything happens, it typically happens at the worst time, and that's typically in the heat of summer when the uh, grass definitely needs the water the most. So not having that disruption, uh, allowing them to have those greener greens and uh, uh, fairways for, for all the uh, um, golfers to enjoy while they're out there on the course. So this was a great opportunity uh, in which we were invited in and helped this customer out and hopefully we'll continue to help them out in solving their um, sustainability goals and filtration needs. So with that being said, we have one more poll question here for you guys. So after learning more about the hydraulic filtration, how do you feel about recycled water for golf course irrigation? Please select one of the above. All right, closing the poll in five, four, three, two. Awesome. Thank you all again for participating in the poll. So, you know, definitely some people still happy with their, their fresh um, and potable water. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's just the situation you have where it's not easy to have the recycled water areas. Um, glad to see some people are thinking about potentially switching in the future. Um, and then I uh, see split down there at the bottom between using recycled water, happy with their filtration system or considering changing. So, um, you know, really want to thank you guys all for participating in this and, you know, uh, listening to our presentation today on golf course irrigation. So, um, you know, we have been in the industry for uh, over 25 years um, and have a wealth of experience here uh, on irrigation for for golf courses using hydraulic screen filters and you know we're over 2,000 golf courses throughout the country um, and here's some of our filters in action here on display uh, at a couple pump stations uh, throughout the country um, so once again thank you for your time today uh, like Jerry mentioned earlier if you have any questions about hydraulic filtration please reach out to us um, we'll make sure to pass along our contact information and yeah, thank you again for joining. So I'll pass it over to Sonia for questions. 
Thank you, Jordan. We have a couple of questions that are coming in right now or have come in. I'm going to list Jordan and Jerry to help with the answer of those. Before I move on to the question, I don't want to remind everybody that we have several uh, handouts available for you to download and that the contact information is available if you have any questions or any support that we can provide to you with your current filtration or lack of filtration system in your facility. So with that said, let's start with the first one and I'm gonna enlist Jerry to answer this one. What is the degree of filtration um, on these filters? In other words, um, from how, what micron to mi what micron can you remove? For sure, example? absolutely, uh, it's a good question. So I'll go ahead and start with, you know, again, it goes to what degree are you really needing to pull out of your water? But we have screens that are adjustable anywhere from 10 to the 1000 micron levels. Uh, so again, uh, as a reminder, typically what we see in the golf course is uh, to prove effective on sprinkler air protections is somewhere between the 100 to 300 micron ranges. Um, but the filter itself can uh, be, you know, changed between 10 to 1,000. Uh, the key thing to remember there is when it comes to sizing and we're talking about flow, uh, we want to make sure that we're considering the degree of filtration when it comes to flow. So when as we start to finer, when we start to go down finer in screen, we start to derate the flow. So that may cause us to increase the size of the filter. So again, it depends on what your degree of filtration objective is um, and the flow design of your system. And that will help us kind of come to a solution for what will best uh, suit what you need. Thank you, Jerry. Next one I'm going to ask Jordan about. I know you mentioned it, the flush water, but how much flush water, we had a person ask it, how much flush water is used? Yeah, so that's a great question. So it's about 1%, just a little bit less of the total flow going through the filter. So for just the ease of example, so our, our nomenclature, how it works is uh, we have the label here V1000, and that means that this filter can handle 1000 GPM with 100 micron screen. So we'll just assume that's what it is. So if we have 1000 GPM moving through this filter, we're gonna be losing about 10 GPM for that 10 to 15 second period. Uh, so you know, let's assume it's just a maximum of 15 seconds. You're losing about you know, two and a half gallons per flush cycle for that scenario. Okay, thank you, Jordan. Jerry, what is the minimum pressure required to operate the system? The high so we were yeah, good, good question. Great question. So we do experience this in some applications, not many, uh, where the pressure is less than what we minimally recommend. But we do recommend having a minimum of 30 PSI through the filter. And the reason why we're looking at this is because as it goes to flushing, we're relying on some of that flow and that pressure to help with the aid of suction through the suction nozzles to pull that dirt that's starting to embed and cake on top of the screens. So um, that's what we're usually looking at as a minimum is that 30 PSI range. But that's not to say that we can't come up with a solution for the low pressure applications. There are various different things that we can do. And we have a, a, a little white paper on talking about the few different options, i.e. we can you know, you know, work on um, isolating or, or cutting back on some of the outlet uh, pressure to increase pressure within the vessel. Uh, we can add a little centrifugal suction pump to the flush line to help pull the water. Uh, so there's a, a few different things we can do in low pressure, but typically we're looking at a minimum of 30 PSI. But if you have an application that's less than that, feel free to reach out to your Evoqua rep uh, that can help you come up with a solution for that specific example. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Jordan, mm -hmm. what drives the screw, the, the, the bidirectional screw? Yeah, that, that's a great question um, and kind of, piggybacking off of Jerry. So uh, when we do enter that flush cycle, uh, we create that pressure differential between your inlet pressure and atmospheric for your flush line um, or wherever it's going through a lower pressure area. And when we have that pressure differential, water is gonna move through those suction nozzles, through the hollow tube and out the water jet, which is in the flush chamber over here. And uh, whenever that happens, those water jets are pointed in opposite directions and they will start to rotate the suction nozzles on the axis that the bidirectional screw is on. And it will start to move the suction nozzles up and down the internal screen there to get a full clean and, and the single pass. Uh, but that all happens over that 10 to 15 second period. And uh, it's similar to a fishing bale is probably the best way to, mm -hmm. to think about it when you're looking at the internals of these filters when they're in operation. Perfect. If I can Jerry, add to that, yeah, yeah if I can add, just add to real, that's a great explanation, Jordan, but that's really where the magic happens. And when we're talking about this hydraulic screen filter versus some of the other ones, that's what I consider the magic component right there. You limit the electric motors and pistons that's required 
uh, to ensure a cleaning cycle, we have that reverser screw. As Jordan mentioned, you know, just right now is kind of, you can imagine a fishing reel where the line goes up and then it goes back. And so, yes, there's a great picture. So it's really kind of hard to see there is that yellow section in there. It's a, you know, you know, probably a 10 inch plastic rod. We have them in bronze as well uh, to where that pole, as that shaft rotates, as Jordan mentions, that pole, um, there we go. There's, you can kind of see the grooves in there. So basically as it rotates, it's forcing the nozzles to go down that reverser and back up the reverser. So there's no limit switches. It's literally driven across those grooves and back. And so that ensures you don't have to worry about limit switches failing. Uh, you don't have any external protrusions going into that bulkhead there at the end where the cap is with the entrance to the screen. You don't have the drive motor, anything going in and out. It's completely enclosed vessel. So really, I think, you know, the, the magic, as I, I said previously, is really in that reverser that, that helps to, you know, bring it all together to ensure you get a cleaning cycle without all those maximum parts. That, that alone is what cuts out all the extra parts and components. So just want to kind of add that extra context to it. All right. Jordan, what power is needed for operating the BAF filter? So no power really needed to operate the filter, but we do need power to operate the flush valve. And so typically, uh, depending on what type of pump station you have, you can supply power from there, but it's you know, our typical micro flush controller that we uh, partner or that we use with these uh, is just a, a 110, 120 volt outlet. <clears throat> and that sends a, a, a low voltage relay. Um, signal to, to a solenoid valve to operate the flush valve, and that's it. Okay, so we have one more question here to answer before um, we conclude our presentation today. I'm going to send it to Jerry. What are the materials of construction of these filters? Great, yeah, so as I mentioned, a good question. Um, so yeah, when it comes to challenges, exterior, you know, environmental conditions, we do have our, our smallest model, the 200P in a plastic. Um, that's the only one that's available in the plastic. Outside of that, we start moving to our stainless steel. And so we have these in 316 stainless. We also have the ability to go into higher grades of stainless, such as 904 or the 2205 duplex. Um, so we do see these where there's high salinity environments where we want you know, a higher level of protection against corrosion and rust. And that's where we'll start to move into some of the higher grades of stainless, which is the 904 and 2205. Perfect. Thank you very much. I don't see any more questions coming in today. Um, I am going to thank you all again for joining us today and thank you for your time. And I'm, I'm going to send it back to Lisa for the conclusion um, of the webinar. Thank you all. Excellent. Well done, everyone. Um, we appreciate Evoca's team providing this information and providing these options to help make our water go further for our planet. Um, they have arranged for this webinar to award GCSA education points. So you are going to need to use this code 999-249-43018 on the GCSA website. So you'll go to your profile and put that in. For those that are viewing the recording at a future date, Make sure you use the date you're watching so that the points are awarded to your correct renewal cycle. Let me give you that code again, 999-249-493018. And we want to thank Evoca and their team for making this event possible as you exit today. You will see an exit survey and your input is important to us. We appreciate you um, answering those questions and including if you have any topics that you wanna see. I'm gonna go ahead and advance here to our end slide which shows a number of sources. One of your handouts in the GoToWebinar control panel is this document sent and you'll be able to uh, follow up and read more about some of these items if you choose to do so. We'll also have those handouts available um, in a couple of days in the Learning Hub, so you can log in and check that out. I'm seeing no other questions here. Thank you all again for a job well done. 
thanks to those who joined us. And we'll see you all online again soon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone.